Yeah. Yep. Great. Well, look, welcome to Introduction to Permaculture Principles as part of Ramwick Council's Eco Living Online Festival. I'd like to pass on a really big uh, welcome from Ramwick City Council's Mayor, Danny Sepp. And my name is Julian Lee, and I'm from Ramwick Council's Sustainability Team. And I'm here today with Jess Perini, who is a permaculture expert and a member at the Ramwick Community, uh, Ramwick Community Organic Gardens, which is where we are. And a big thank you to Chris, who is behind the camera, helping us out today. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge that the people in Rambic City are meeting on the land of the Gadigal and the Vidigal people who occupied the Sydney coast and being the <laughs> traditional owners. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where, where all of you are meeting today. I acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders past and present and to the Aboriginal people in attendance today. Um, so, the last thing is, as you know, the session is being recorded. We'll be sending a brief survey afterwards. We really love the feedback. It helps us make it better for next time. And um, like I said, keep yourselves on mute just so we don't get the background noise. Uh, we might have some background noise because we are next to a football field and a road. But let us know if you can't hear us. And uh, questions through chat and I can relay them to this, but occasionally there'll be a great opportunity to actually speak out loud. We'll probably make that pretty clear. Thanks, Jess, over to you. Thank you, Julianne. Thank you, Chris, for the camera. Um, thanks everyone for coming today. It's a real pleasure to have you here at Randwick. And it's really exciting to hear that there are people coming from all sorts of places as, as far as Perth, as, as far as I know. <laughs> Um, but there have been people coming from overseas as well for other, other workshops and it's just great to have you. This is actually a unique opportunity for us at Randwick because usually we have much smaller groups and um, here today apparently lots of you so that's really exciting to see. Um, so I've got have limited time today and we have lots and lots to get through. I'm not going to be talking to all 12 permaculture principles because it's just way too much one hour. But we're just going to be jumping around and, and getting some, um, some of the highlights, let's say. Um, and these guys are going to be winding me up if I talk too long. So if you have any questions, as Julian said, please do type in the chat pod and Julian will relay those to me at a certain stage. But I'm just going to keep talking and try and get you through as many principles as I can today. That's right. We're just trying to get a bit more sun on your face. Oh, okay. It's very dark. Sorry, we're just playing with the bright sun here. So what is permaculture? Permaculture is a design system. It's based on the principles of nature and it's based on the power of observation. So basically, it's something that everybody can do. It's very flexible. It's not a set of rules per se or ways of doing things per se. It's more a set of guidelines. So it sets out 12 of these guidelines for you. And if you can work within those, you can do all sorts of different things. So it's not, you know, it's not this sort of thing where you have to do a certain thing. You can actually, it, the permutations of permaculture are limitless. So once you learn the guidelines, there's more of lighting of the path to, to flow your way. So um, there are three ethics and there are 12 principles. The, mainly it's about living lightly and consuming less. Um, it's about sustainability. It's about how we can personally change the world. Then goes into communities and then it also goes into global actions. So it's not just about one person doing one thing, it's one person and their connections across the board. So you'll find that one thing leads to another thing leads to another and once we make all these connections, we have a much greater ripple effect. So you can use it for personal things at home, you can use it for community things. You can use it for global things. It's really exciting. And once you learn about permaculture, you'll really get into it. So I'm just going to talk about 
ethics just really quickly. As we all know, there are a lot of depressing things happening in the world today. There's, there's the peak oil situation, there's climate change, which is the biggest threat we have to this planet and to our lifestyle today. Um, we also have degradation of species, animals, um, the earth, soil. There is so much going on. So we have these three ethics to guide us along the way. And what they are is care for earth, which is obvious. We look around us and we see what we have around us and we are the caretakers of that. The second principle is care for people. We care for each other, we care for our communities, we care for the global community. And the third principle, most importantly, is fair share. And fair share is when we have so much, we produce so much, we have far more than anything that we need. So what we can do is we can share that excess. We don't need to hoard. We don't need to be there, you know, just holding on to things. We can let go of them and we can share them. So those are the three ethics. Um, in this garden, we have 73 members and we have, um, we have communal plots and we have individual plots. So what we do is we harvest the excess at the working bee at the end of the month and then we share it around for everyone. So it's a really great system and uh, it's based on a community. So if you want to be a member here at Randwick Community Organic Garden, um, you have to be an active member of the community to get a plot and to work with us. So you're expected to join a group and together we work. And then we, we harvest the excess. So fair share is a big part of what we do. Um, and this manifests in all sorts of different ways and incredible and wonderful ways. We've had workshops here where people come along and they're just really interested in gardening and then they go on to find found national movements. Um, there are people who came to our workshops in 2012 and have found movements like, for example, Crop Swap, um, which is now across Australia. Um, permaculture touches all levels of life. So there are things like the Garage Sale Trail, which is now um, out in the world, uh, which is really exciting. Um, there are co-ops, people sharing food, people um, swapping clothing, uh, financial co-ops. There are all sorts of things like free cycle and the circular economy. Permaculture touches all of these things. And it's really exciting. People think that we, we're we just about gardening, but actually it touches all areas of life and whether personal finance, whether how you organize your home, your garden, your life, permaculture can touch that. So I need to move on to principles because we're running out of time. So um, the next slide, we go to the 12 principles. Um, just, I'll just yeah. get the screen share yeah. ready. Get the screen share ready. So we just pop on to, we're going to slide four. I've jumped ahead of everyone now. <laughs> Excuse yeah. us for a sec. Slide okay, four. So there we go. Yep. So these are all the principles. As I mentioned, we won't have time to talk about them all today. So if you want to take a screenshot, everybody, if you're on your computer, you can take a screenshot. Um, but this recording will be available right to everyone later yeah, on. Yeah, yep. Yep, so you It'll can also always be watch available it. on Randy Council's YouTube channel. Fantastic. So you can, you can take a screenshot of it now or you can watch it again later on. But those are the 12 principles. Um, so initially, we are going to start with principle one, which is observe and interact. And we're going to start here. This is the mandala of Randwick Community Organic Garden. Now, um, can you go to principle one? Yep. We just keep going next time. Just getting our slides to catch up. Oh. 
The slides aren't progressing. Progressing. No. There oh, we here go. We go. Observe and interact. Now, could you just go to the next slide? Thank you. So you'll see on this slide there are different there are different things. So what do I want to say is that when we observe and interact, this is the foundation of permaculture. Observation is what we do. Um, I'll give you an example. As a wildlife carer, um, I know that you see a, a bird on the ground and you think, oh, I just want to go save that bird. What can I do? So you run over and you save the bird. But what happens is that that bird could just be learning to fly. It might be a fledgling and it might not be in trouble. So as humans, really my point is that we tend to run in and we tend to want to do things. We tend to want to go and manipulate a situation. And the first principle of permaculture is probably one of the most important ones. It says, don't run in. It says, stand back. It says, look at the bigger picture. Because that is all important. People will come and say, hey, what do I do about this aphid on the crop? And I'll say, actually, have you stood back and looked at what is, how it's part of the bigger picture? Um, really, if you're going to be designing a site, the first thing I want you to do is pick out your site and have a look at it over a 24-hour period. And the best way to do that is to get your little camera out and take photos. Just set your tripod down and take photos throughout the day. And what that does is it gives you a perspective on your site that you might not otherwise have. You might not have that perspective of where the shadows or where the trees are or what's coming into your site and how the energy is flowing through it. So it's really important to kind of step back from your usual mindset and think, I have to look at this somehow in a way that I don't normally look at it and then observe the patterns that you see happening through it. So the reason I have that slide there is that I want you to take photos of shadows, but I want you to take photos of light. I want you to look down at your feet, see what's down there, but you also have to look up, up into the sky and have a look at the clouds. Have a look at the buildings next to you. What are the buildings doing and how are they casting shade on you and how are they protecting your site if they are protecting you? Um, there are so many things that affect our site and so many things that impact on what we're doing. And before we do anything, we need to be aware of what those patterns are. So that's why I have all those photos there because I want to remind you that you don't just look down at your feet. And I have one experience here where I said to people, okay, we're going to go out and look at things. And they all went out and they all looked down like this at their feet. And they, and I said, okay, what's the massive tree that's, that was above you in the Eastern area? And everyone's like, uh, uh, I saw the mint. <laughs> and they didn't, they hadn't actually looked up and around at, the massive surroundings and that's the trick of our brain we tend to ignore certain features of things and it's really important to be able to step back and take in a full picture um, and taking photos helps you to do that so I think that's really important when we observe and interact um, so also in that photo I captured a lacewing which was flying across look really closely there is a lacewing flying across towards on the left hand bottom photo into the sunflower so you'll actually see some interactions there which you might not have seen otherwise um, so that's that's it i want you to walk your mic walk your neighborhoods go through see what the water's doing see what the land is doing see what's happening in the air see what's happening in the climate just try and get a good perspective of everything. Um, our next point is catch and store energy. And we're going to move to the next slide now. And we're also going to move around the garden. So come along with me. 
and <laughs> try to find our path I'll through the garden. While we're moving so they can see. Okay. So we're just coming along to here. Um, where was I going to stand? Is this a good spot? Thanks, everybody. So here, the second principle is catch and store energy. Um, here we've got some really good examples. We've got a catchment, uh, water and solar catchment. Um, so this is actually a drip irrigation system and it's powered by solar. So that's a really obvious example of catch and store energy. And um, that's a really great little mini system that someone has set up and that automatically drips down into the garden bed when, um, when the person wants some moisture. Now, there's a lower tech option over to my left here. Now, this is just a simple catchment. Um, there's water here and that is just using drip irrigation so that actually just goes through the plot um, with a drip pipe there and um, so that's a really simple version there. Um, I, as a permaculturist, I like to go as low tech as absolutely possible um, and it's really important to consider that because you have to think about what the energy is um, in terms of something that gone into a system. So for example, it takes a lot of energy to produce a solar panel. Um, but what we have on site, what here, actually doesn't take much energy at all. So in terms of water catchment, my favourite water catchment system is compost. Um, so here you'll see this really luscious compost um, this is one of the best water catchment systems you, you can have. It can hold up to five times the amount of water of regular soil. So when you are talking about catching and storing energy, don't necessarily go to the high step. Sorry, hopefully you can hear me. Um, don't necessarily go to the high tech solutions. Um, think about the lower tech solutions. Think about soil and its water holding capacity and compost. Think about mulch. Think about green manures. Um, you don't have to go out, run out to Bunnings to buy things. Okay, so think low tech. Think embodied energy. Think about what it takes to get to create a system. So if it takes more um, resources to create what you're buying, it might not be worth actually going out and buying all those things. Permaculture is really about thinking about, okay, what have I got here and now and how can I use that? So yeah, by all means, you know, you can get a water tank and whatever, you can get buckets, you can um, capture the sun's energy through the leaves of your plants. You could go high tech, low tech, but always, always think about the embodied energy involved in what you're getting and what you're using. Um, so yeah, you can catch and store energy many different ways. Um, obtain a yield is my next principle. Now this is a quickie, um, mainly because it's pretty obvious um, whether you're getting kumquats or passion fruit or there's more kumquats there or silver beet or beetroot, whatever it is, when you go into a permaculture site, don't go in and, and slave away and then come out feeling exhausted and thinking, what was that all for? It's really important that you get a yield. Otherwise, we're pretty much just slaves. So no one enjoys being a slave and we all enjoy getting some, some reward for our labor. So the beauty of permaculture is that usually the rewards are great. 
and you usually have so much that you can share with other people. So obtaining a, a yield is a really important one. Never walk away from a site without having something from that site to, to <laughs> take in. Um, the next point is, is apply self-regulation and accept feedback. So um, can we go to that slide, Julian? So that is principle four. Now, I'm not gonna to talk too much about that. You can see a very sick plant on principle four. Um, people tend to go out and say, what can I buy? What can I buy? What chemical can I buy? What can I, you know, what can I do with this? Um, without actually thinking about the process that came to that. So if you think about that plant and you, you read the plant, you say, okay, well, this plant's got some sort of a fungi or a bacteria and maybe I'm doing something wrong. So maybe I need to change my watering practices. Maybe I need to stop watering the plant from above. Maybe I need to stop watering the plant at night time when the water stays on the, on the leaves and actually water from below in the soil. Um, maybe I need to stop the crowding of the leaves and actually give airflow to the plant so that the fungi don't take over. So the natural response is not run out to Bunnings and buy antifungal. Go out, actually look at the plant, see what it needs and then see how you can alter your practice to deal with that. Okay, so the next slide is um, slide 13, use and value renewable resources. Now, um, in this garden, we just have, yeah, that's it. And we, um, if you go to slide 14, um, you'll see seeds. Um, that's an echinacea seed and one of my favorite plants. Um, we're, and it's right here actually, can I? Can I go here? Anyway. So they're on the screen share. Okay. Stop the screen share. Um, so this is the here. Um, so as you can see, um, sort of and the seeds are coming out. So once these seeds are dry, this is going to be an amazing resource. And typically, depending on the plant, but for example, lettuce, you can get, you know, a thousand seeds from uh, you know, five grams of lettuce. And so, I mean, it's an incredible resource, and it's not something that we can take lightly, particularly during these pandemic times when um, we have seen a run on seeds, and we've seen a, a run on seedlings, and people have been panicking about whether they can head out and buy things from the nursery but permaculture is a lot more relaxed about these things because we've actually got resources all around us that mean that we don't have to rely on that external and we can be a lot more self-sufficient um, we're looking at setting up some seed libraries here in Randwick and in bondi so um, if anyone is interested get in contact with us there's already a great seed savers group in the inner west, inner west seed savers, and there are seed savers networks. So do get in contact, Google them. Um, there are fantastic resources available. Um, I've also got Comfrey there on one of the slides, um, Julian, if you can uh, go to slide 14. Um, Comfrey is one of the most incredible resources you can use in a garden. Um, okay, I need to move to. Okay, can I? Can we just? Um, can we just move back to? Yeah. Sorry, everyone. We're just moving. Humphrey is the is the picture to the right. User. 
So, sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm not holding this because this is particularly prickly. Um, this is comfrey. It's one of the most valuable renewable resources you can have in a garden. Um, it's usually in Australia, we use the Bocking 14 variety, which is the Russian variety. Um, it's perennial. It grows like wild in this garden. Um, if you're starting off a permaculture garden, this is something you need to have in your garden. Now, it's got multiple uses. Uh, we use it as a compost accelerator. So we can, you can basically um, just chop it all up and pop it in your compost. You use it as a, um, as a foliar feed. So you can put it in the water, you can steep it in water for a few weeks, and then you can, um, then you can just um, water it down uh, in a 15 to one ratio, it can be quite strong. So then you can use it as a foliar feed. Um, it can mine nutrients from the soil. So it's actually got this really tremendous tap root. And I was, going to, I was trying to pull one out to show you and it was so strong I couldn't pull it out. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you have this tremendous tap root and basically, if you have one comfrey, all your friends have comfrey. So you cut it up and you can plant it out and all of those roots will come up with more, more leaves. Um, it has got all the essential nutrients, well, all the main nutrients that plants, other plants need. So if you put it in your compost, it will break down very quickly and give those, those nutrients to your other plants. Um, but it also has trace elements in it which are vitally important to plants. So comfrey is one of those things that you don't neglect in a permaculture garden. It also has significant nectar. So the bees will love it as well. Um, okay, now reduce no waste. We're quickly gonna go to the compost system and, and move to the, the, um, the next slide. Now you've all seen compost. Um, we have lots of different I'll just compost bins. While they see the slide, they don't really see you. Oh, okay. So no worries. Um, you need to allow time for the, to stop on the slide. No worries. So what we are seeing here is um, our compost systems. So we have various systems. Oh, okay. Sorry, we're just having some technical issues. No, no, it's just, oh. you can't do that. Oh, okay. All right. So, this will go. All right. Um, we're going to go to here. Um, so, if we can just come off the slides. Yep. Yeah. So, this is our composting system. Um, and we have a diversity of composting systems actually. Um, it's because it, it covers our bases a bit more. So if you have different systems, you, it just means that things are cooking along while you can do other things. So for example, we've got a closed compost system here. Um, and then we have open bins here, which have signage on them. And that will tell you something is cooking along. Um, or something is full and not to add to it, or there are certain bins for weeds as well. So when we have weeds of a particular variety, if we don't want to risk getting the seeds in a certain area, we will drown those weeds. So if you come over here, you can have a look at our weed tea bins. Okay, so these are cooking along. And um, these are full of the weeds that we can't put in our composting system. So don't throw them out, don't put them in your bin, put them in water, leave them for a few weeks or a month, and you will be able to, oh, heavy. Okay, so this is covered so that it doesn't get mozzies in it, but 
and I wish there was smell vision because it's pretty it's stinky. pretty stinky, isn't it? It's pretty stinky. So you so, filled this all the way to the top? Or? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. fill it all the way to the top and then you fill it up with water and then in a month or so's time, it's ready to go as fertiliser. How do you know when it's ready? Like if how do you know when it's ready? Um, basically, everything dies down. And it sort of just disintegrates it, in the water? It disintegrates in the water. It's all sludgy. It's pretty gross. <laughs> but that's why but the weeds die in it. They, weeds die in it. This is where the weeds come to die. a question from, what about a blackberry nightshade? Yeah, yeah, you can do all sorts of weeds in here and, and their seeds. So, talking about bidens, we're talking about um, potato vine, we're talking about all those horrible things that you would not put in your compost, put them in here and just drown them. And if you're scared that they might still be alive, leave it another month and, you know, let it go. Because um, what we typically do with the leftovers when this, when this comes out is that we will use the carbon material, the dead material in our compost. So I know this works because otherwise, we would have massive weed problems in our compost um, because the weeds here. So this is a working system. Um, so yeah, value your weeds, um, value what's on the side, produce no waste. Please, if you're at home and you don't compost yet, please find a system, a little Bakashi bin at home. You can bring it here. Having said that, if you're gonna bring here, take part in the compost team and help everyone out because we need as much help as we can get when it comes to composting. So we really want to encourage people to become part of the community um, and not just come and drop things off. We really want you to value your waste, come be part of the community and learn to process waste as well. If you want to learn how to compost, you can. So we're very happy to teach you and we're really excited about that because um, Food in landfill is a big thing. So we want to reduce that as much as possible. There's a bit of a question here that's on this theme that I think really does speak to the permaculture principles. Absolutely. Which is around, you know, there's, there's a question here. So I'm, I'm taking it to the side a little bit, which is, is there a list on Ramwick Council's website? So I'm not getting you to answer that. Yeah. Around what's a good weed and a bad weed. But I guess I'm, I'm wanting to push that to, what do we call weeds in permaculture? Well, that's a really interesting question because we actually do value certain weeds in this garden and weeds are typically seen as plants out of place but for me a weed is really different because and I do actually speak to this in one of the next slides which I don't know if I'm going to have time to get to it but a weed is something that will tell me something so if I have I might see a weed here say for example chickweed and there will be some gardeners tidy gardeners who say that's a weed and i'll actually say you know what it's got a use and i can eat that so maybe it's not a weed so permaculture actually gets you to think about things in a different way so it it let's say I, I don't tolerate certain plants in my garden. So yeah, they might be typically weeds. I don't tolerate bidens, for example. They go everywhere, they drive me crazy, and I put them in here. So bidens, so, bidens is farmer's friend? Farmer's or friend, pegs? yeah, co cobbler's pegs, yeah. yeah. So I will put them in here. Um, there are uses for bidens. So there might be someone like Diego Benito out there, if you're watching, um, who loves weeds and will eat them and will use them. So that particular one, I know it has its uses, but I prefer to put it in here. Um, some people might, might say, okay, well, I'm gonna use that for a certain reason. I'm actually using it for its nutrients. So I'm still valuing it just in a different way. Um, there, we had chickweed in um, Chippendale, sustainable Chippendale, and there were some chefs coming through and they're actually picking it. So while the Chippendale people were pulling it out, the chefs were coming through and valuing it. So you have to think about weeds in different ways in permaculture. Um, there are some which I just do not want to take over and sometimes I put yamaranth in here 
Like if I have enough spinach and I have enough greens in my garden, I might not add the extra amaranth to my diet. I might put it in here. So you have to stop and think. You think, okay, is there a use for this weed or is there a use for this plant? What is that use and what is it telling me? So um, I might actually talk about this issue here. Weeds actually are a language unto themselves. So if you were to actually get a weed that has a really long taproot on it, that's actually telling you something about your soil. That often might be telling you that, that your soil is compacted and that you need to go in and dig it up and aerate it a little bit. Um, or you may find a weed that has really fibrous roots and that might be the opposite situation. That might actually be telling you that your soil has been disturbed and that um, that's when the pioneer weeds come in. So you've got to really, don't just go in there with the weeds, dig them out and then throw them away or put them in here. Think about what is it? Is it telling me that my pH is too high or too low? Is it telling me that my soil has been disturbed, that it's too compacted? Is it telling me that it has certain nutrients but not others? Certain weeds really like certain nutrients and certain weeds don't. So you might have a situation where a weed is really high in nitrogen and it's actually really good for you. So you can use that take that in, make soups with it, whatever. But also look at your soil and think, hang on a second, maybe I haven't topped up my soil with compost lately. Maybe I need to put in some nitrogen and actually get other stuff growing in here. Or maybe I need to grow crops that harvest nitrogen from the, the air and actually put them into the roots. And when they die down, they will feed the soil. So you really have to think about weeds in a completely different way when you come to permaculture. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> uh, okay, so next, I think we need to move on. Um, slide number 17 is design from patterns to details. So, Designing from patterns to details, while Julian is bringing up the slides, is really about thinking about life cycles. So we're thinking about the cycles of birth, growth, and death. And people think this is a hard concept to, to get their head around, but it's really not. It's when you look about the cycles of nature and you think about how the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west and you look about at the prevailing winds, the pattern of the prevailing winds, there might be southwesterlies in your area. Um, given that many of us might be coming from Randwick, you know, we have the southwesterlies. Um, that's a pattern. And if you look at your garden or your porch or your life or your house or whatever it is you're designing, as a part of a grander pattern and think about how you use that resource. Um, where is it that you walk in? Where is it that you spend your time? Where is it that most of the people congregate? Um, look at the grander patterns of it and then design for the grander pattern of it and then design for the detail. A lot of people, when they come into a garden, they think, oh, I want to plant roses and I want to plant this and plant that, but they don't think about their situation. So they don't think, okay, this balcony is in westerly sunlight all day long. The pattern of that is baking sun on your, all day long. Okay, all afternoon, I should say. <laughs> okay, not all day long. Um, the pattern of that is that you'll get you'll get baked plants basically. So if you're going to put plants that love shade in a in a baking balcony, that's not going to work. So when you come into your design, think about the bigger patterns, the climate patterns, the patterns from birth to death, 
uh, it's really so important to to do it on a bigger scale first. Think about those grander patterns and then work down to your detail from that. Um, it's a far too big a concept to go into any detail, but um, I'll just let you read up on that one. Now, our next system is we go to slide 20, which is integrate, not segregate. And I'm going to take you over to the aquaponics system now. Okay. Now, this is a system we set up about 10 years ago. And um, it's a really interesting example of integrate, not segregate. So. see our aquaponics system um, that was in slide 21 and um, here it is live here um, it's growing a whole bunch of watercress at the moment which is flowering and here we have fish down in the pond um, so the whole point of an aquaponics system is is different to something like hydroponics for example in that it doesn't use any chemicals. It uses, it recycles a limited amount of water. And um, what happens is that it uses the cycles of nature to feed itself and to clean itself. So essentially what this is, is the fish create nutrient in their waste and that nutrient is pumped up into the grow beds and that nutrient is used by the plants to power the plants. And then what happens in these grow beds, um, we have, um, these are recycled roof tiles. So you can see here that these are just recycled resources. Um, and you can use uh, river pebbles, you can use all sorts of things, but not soil. It's not a soil based thing. Um, and those grow beds clean out, act as a filtration system. They clean out the excess nutrient of the fish, and then the water is returned to the aquaponics unit below, uh, clean to the fish. So it's a really great integrated system of um, growing. We are looking for a team to come in and and adopt the system. So come on down, become a member, and adopt our aquaponics system. It'd be great to have you. So um, just wondering if there's probably any questions about aquaponics. I don't know. It's a, it's a difficult thing. To, is there anything that we want to? Okay. All right. No worries. Um, another integrated system that we have here is called a biopod. Now that's on slide 22. Um, biopod, I don't know if any of you have heard about biopods, but they're really fascinating things. And this is the point at the, of the talk where you can leave if you're squeamish. Um, biopod is a producer of protein. And the protein comes in the form of maggots. So <laughs> I know you're all thinking, oh my God, this is awful. But um, we use the bipod. I don't have it here. I actually have it at home. Once again, through lack of anyone adopting the system, I have taken the system home. So we were using the bipod to raise food for the fish and food for the chickens. Um, it's basically a really, really simple system. It's, it's based on a, um, a trash can, an old um, bin. You get an old bin 
and um, you use it to compost food. And what happens is a black soldier fly will come and visit that bin and she has wings. She flies in and she lays her eggs on the top of the bin, of the lid, and then those eggs drop down into the food and they become larvae and the larvae eat the food. And you see there's a link on, on the um, on slide number 22. If you are curious about that, you can type in that link. I've given you, um, I've given you the bit.ly address so you can type in the, the link. Um, it will actually take you to a video of how the black soldier fly work. And black soldier fly work very, very quickly. They actually work much, much more quickly than any worms or any composting system you have ever seen. And they will basically demolish a hamburger in about 10 hours, I believe. <laughs> um, so you can have a very small amount of black soldier fly larvae. Now they are not freaky maggots like fly maggots. They don't squirm around, they're more like slaters. Um, and they're very active in summertime, sort of around the 25 degree mark when it gets warmer. And um, they can come in and they don't, unlike flies, they don't come into your house. Black soldier flies are not interested in food because they do not have mouths. So basically the only point of a black soldier fly is to fly around to mate, come back into the biopod, release the egg, and, and the larvae eat the compost. So the beauty of this system is that the larvae actually self-harvest. So what happens is that once they've finished eating their, their, all that great food in your system, they will actually climb up and we've created a ramp in the biopod. They'll actually climb up the ramp and self-harvest into a yogurt tub and clean themselves on the way, which is fantastic. So um, then you can just take the, the bucket and you can feed your chickens, you can feed your fish, you can feed live animals in your system. Um, so it's a really great system. If you have wildlife, for example, Black soldier fly larvae are very expensive. So you can actually have a self-sustainable system and perhaps if you produce more than you need, you can sell them. So there you go, little business idea I sent you. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're aquaponic systems and biopod systems and they're integrated. So it's all about integrating things into your system. So you don't actually have to go out and buy things. You can actually create a food system to grow things, to, to feed your animals. Um, your animals can feed your plants, your plants can clean out the nutrient and send that back as clean water to your fish. So the more you think about systems, the better it is in terms of your, your permaculture system and the less they need you. So you won't be needed so much when you get these systems up in play. Um, so the next uh, system is slow and small solutions. So let's walk on over to our bees. These are native bees. They're stingless. They come from Queensland. I don't know if you'll be able to see them too well. They're tiny. So. Somebody's, um, just, somebody's just mentioned that one of their bins is full of black soldier flies. Yeah, that's right. I thought they were really bad. Should they just no. have to fall out of the bin or? Yeah, they will self-harvest. So once they're ready, they'll, they'll come out and um, you can harvest them. You can feed them to chickens. You can feed them to fish. They're super high protein source and not so bad just, at just all it's it's an indicator to me that you've probably got too much food in your in your compost bin and it's not coping so if you don't want them there i would pull back on the nutrients <laughs> that you're putting into your compost bin um but if you do want them there then you can actually use them as a food source later on 
Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about them because, as I say, the flies are only there to mate and they will only mate around your compost bin. So they're good. They're just telling me you've got too much food in there. <laughs> um, so small and slow solutions. Uh, we're not about running out to the shops and buying things. We're here to just say, let's let nature work for us. So the smallest and slowest solution we have here at the garden, you can find it in slide 24. Uh, just Julian will just ramp up for you. Um, is the ladybird or lady beetle, as you might know them, or as we here at Randwick call them, the vultures of the bug world, but not really. Um, they are one of the best things in the garden. If you see lady beetles, there are many, many varieties. Most of them are good guys. Do not squish them. Um, they're fantastic at eating aphids. They're really great at all sorts of, uh, all sorts of beneficials in the garden. Um, even better than lady beetles are their larvae. And that is slide 25. So just have a really good look at this slide. I want you to look. They look absolutely nothing like the lady beetles. So if you see these guys around, they're not caterpillars. They look kind of like caterpillars, but they're not. So just have a look at these guys. Leave them alone. They are your friends in the garden. Um, so they're the stage before the lady beetle. That yeah, used. that's right. So yeah, you'll see lots of these little things around and you'll wonder what they are. Um, I think the lady beetles will eat about 10 to 20, the larvae will eat 10 times as much as far as I understand. So in the earlier stages, they're really hungry. So do note that, don't squish the babies. <laughs> um, slide number 26 is the, now I've done that because I am actually standing next to our beehive, but I don't think you can see them too well because they're absolutely tiny. Um, they're about two to five millimeters in length and they, they're stingless bees. They're from Queensland. Um, they do exist far, as far south as Vega and they are our friends in the garden. So they are really good pollinators for certain crops. Um, they do well on tomatoes, I've seen them on papaya, I've seen them on things with small flowers. Um, we don't harvest the honey because they only produce about one kilo of honey a year down south in Sydney. Um, in Queensland they can produce up to three kilos. So this honey is some of the most prized honey among Indigenous people. It's low in GI, diabetics can consume it without having spikes in blood sugar. It's brilliant honey, um, but we leave it to the bees um, because we, we value their pollination services and we don't want to tax them overly when they're here. So they're another great small slow solution in the garden. Um, I am very fast running out of time, so I need to move on. But that is our beehive there, and you can see it's the size of three shoe boxes. So if you want, these lived on our, our on our balcony. They happen to live on balconies in Randwick, so um, you can have them in Randwick, and they're stingless. So now we're going to move on to principle number ten. Use and value diversity. Now, uh, if you go to slide 28. Yep, okay. A hundred years ago, there were hundreds of varieties of vegetables. You had about 497 varieties of lettuce. You had 300 varieties of cucumber. You had 
hundreds of radishes. You had melons of all varieties. And people saved their own seed. And basically, it was a much more um, secure food system because they had so many varieties. And having that level of variety means that you have some level of food security because if one variety fails, you can always choose to go to another. Now, all of us have gone to the supermarket and bought a tomato, which tastes like nothing. Um, but here at Randwick, we grow lots and lots of different things. So I, what I wanna to say to you is you, it's really important to value diversity. At the moment, um, corporations are taking over seed libraries, like you cannot believe they're buying out seed companies. I think it's something along the lines of 80% of the seed world seed companies are owned by four different companies. Uh, it's becoming illegal in certain places to collect and sell seeds locally uh, bought, uh, locally uh, bred seeds. So as your act of defiance for today, I'm asking you save your seeds, come to Randwick Garden, come to the Sustainability Hub, go to Transition Bondi, go to Inner West, save your seeds, buy local seeds. They're fantastic. They are uh, bred for this environment. So we will try, um, and we're starting on this journey now, we're trying to save our seeds. They're bred for these climactic conditions and they will hopefully keep us going through difficult times when other things fail. So we see failures up north of all sorts of crops and things that come into the supermarkets and all of a sudden things get very expensive. What we're hoping to get is a little bit of our security in our crops and by doing that at Randwick, um, we really like to encourage you to do that. So we are totally out of time, I think. Um, I, there are a million other things I'd love to talk to you about, but unfortunately, it's just not gonna to happen today. So if you want to, please come and visit us. We're here every third weekend of the month. Um, watch our Facebook page and uh, we'd love to see you here. Yeah, look, I, I think that this was an introduction, really fantastic, but a few people at least have asked, and I'm gonna phrase it this way, what, what's your favorite or most recommended permaculture book so that they can go deeper now okay. that we've talked them? Okay, great. Oh, there's so many, there's so many. If you're into seed saving, amazing. Book. This one, fantastic. Jude and Michelle have set up the Seed Savers Network. This one is a must have. I've but, uh, okay, I'm sorry, that's not one book. <laughs> <laughs> Bring them out. Um, Bill, this is the manual. If you really, really, really want to get into this, this is the Bible. Um, Bill Molson is the founder of Permaculture and you cannot go beyond this for really in-depth design principles across all zones. So he, he looks at arid zones, he looks at um, temperate, he looks at forest systems, he looks at across the board. So this is the Bible, it's thick. But for those of you who are starting out, this is the book to get. Um, this is Rosemary Morrow's Earth Use and Side to Permaculture. Teachers use this around the world. I cannot tell you how many translations there are. So if you speak a language other than English, there are many, many translations. Um, it is simple, easy to use. It's full of wonderful illustrations by Rob Oxhoff, who's another, another great illustrator um, and from a culturist. And uh, it's very simple and easy to use. So this is the book that I would recommend. Great. Well, thank you so much. That was amazing. I learned a lot and loved getting to see you around the garden. Thank you to Chris. Guys, take yourself off mute and say thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much for that. See you all down in the garden sometime. Yeah, we'd love to see you. Come on down. I Thanks wish. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from Queensland or Perth, it'll take you a bit longer to get here. Yeah. Make sure, make sure you come and visit us when come you do. Come and visit when you can. Yeah. <laughs> I might do that.
Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you later. Well done. Bye. Bye. You, you Premier won't let me in. Somebody won't let me in. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in Victoria. Oh, sorry, for our Premier not letting you in. Yeah, we can't. We're not allowed. We're not allowed more than five kilometres from home. Well, well, my Premier won't let me back, and I'm calling from Perth. Ah, oh, well, you've got problems too. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.